Good morning, everyone. It is Sunday, June the 7th in 2020. Welcome to worship here at Ansley United Church in Markdale, Ontario. We're so glad that you are joining us each week, and uh, we really do feel like there's a community of people out there that are tuning in each week and uh, and also supporting us too. So thank you so much for your support and for tuning in. Today we're going to begin uh, our prelude with uh, Bill Leggett on violin and David on the piano. gather in the light of Christ. We're surrounded by the light of Christ. We worship with the light of Christ. Thank you, Bill, for that piece that was called I Wonder. Thank you very much. We're going to begin uh, with the singing of the first verse of Holy, Holy, Holy.
So it is Trinity Sunday, and uh, we're going to uh, uh, continue with our call to worship, which has a refrain. And the refrain goes like this, taste and see, oh, taste and see the goodness of our God. That's it. Taste and see, oh, taste and see the goodness of our God. I will bless God at all times. Praise and blessings shall continuously be on my lips. My soul will open and praise the goodness of God. Each moment of every day, in joy and in sorrow, I will open my heart and sing. Taste and see, oh taste and see, the goodness of our God. When I searched for love, I was heartbroken and weary. I was afraid. I was hurt. I was lonely and empty. But the goodness of God's love eased my burdens. God's love became a radiant force within my heart. Now my being is full of lightness and joy. Taste and see. Oh, taste and see the goodness of our God. Keep your own hearts open and free. Take time to dwell in the silence of the earth. Become a peaceful presence in the world, for love is kind and merciful and will always show us the way. Taste and see. Oh, taste and see the goodness of our God. Now, our hymn is called Three Things I Promise, and I have sung this piece for years, and I have never understood the format of the hymn. I did not ever realize what the three things were. Uh, They're all named in the first verse, and then each of the other verses explains a little bit about each one. But the three are to bless God's name, to cling to Christ, and to listen for the Spirit's breath. Those are the three things. So this is called Three Things I Promise. time of prayer and as is our custom we're just having one prayer uh, time in these online services so I have the spoken prayer and then there is time for your own uh, prayer uh, in a quiet moment and then after that we're going to sing um, a response that everybody knows uh, spirit of life today we're going to sing it twice so the first time in the singular which is the way we've all learned it and the second time in the plural so it's just simply a spirit of life, uh, come to us, come to us, etc. So let us pray. We come now to worship, bringing our hearts and minds to the task of living faithfully in this crazy world from one day to the next. We shudder sometimes at the world around us, the fears which are bred in isolation, the rearing up of the ugly head of racism, 
the loneliness and poverty of so many around us. It is sometimes hard to stay focused on what matters most, on our call to be a place where humanity can grow, our call to be a place where the truth of everyone is known and heard, our call to be a place where love is the most powerful force on earth. God, help us be that place. Help us be the people of your name. Help us to stake our claim on the firm ground of your love for us as we have known it in Jesus Christ. And as we do still carry it through your living spirit. As we gather our hearts together, let us choose today to be a source of love for those who need it, a source of peace for those who are anxious, a source of courage for those whose strength is weakening. And most of all, may we be a source of blessing for those who feel anything but blessed. We place our whole selves into your heart, O God, and ask for the strength to be your church once again. And now, a moment of quiet. very much. Wow, it's so nice to have all this extra music here today. Uh, Bill again playing with our uh, hymns and Connie and Leora are now going to sing a duet for us. It's called A Song of Love. Spirit 
Thank you very much. Our scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, this is not uh, a Trinity Sunday scripture reading. Uh, and uh, that's because I've written about five sermons this week trying to figure out uh, what I was going to actually say. And uh, so I ended up with this reading. Mark ten seventeen to 26. As he went out into the street, a man came running up, greeting him with great reverence and said, Good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, Why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments. Don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't lie, don't cheat, and honor your mother and father. He said, Teacher, I have from my youth kept them all. Jesus looked him hard in the eye and loved him. And he said, there's one thing left then for you. Go and sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth. And come and follow me. The man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear and he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not able to let go. Looking at his disciples, Jesus said, do you have any idea how difficult it is for people who have it all to enter God's kingdom? The disciples couldn't believe what they were hearing, but Jesus kept on. You can't imagine how difficult I'd say it's easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for the rich to get into God's kingdom. Well, that set the disciples back on their heels. Who has any chance at all? They asked. Jesus was blunt. No chance at all. If you think you can pull it off by yourself, every chance in the world if you let God help you do it. So here ends our reading from the Gospel of Mark. 
Well, a few years ago, I had a couple of women come to my door when I lived in Toronto. And if you have lived in the city for any length of time, this has probably happened to you many times as well. They were Mormons. They were young. They were friendly. They were engaging. They had these black T-shirts on with four letters in big font across their T-shirt, WWJD, which means what would Jesus do is kind of code language. And right away, I knew when I saw those two standing on my porch that they were probably kind of crazy people trying to sell me on a fake religion, and they were going to manipulate me and draw me in with their friendliness. But I was taken aback by them a little bit. They didn't judge. They just offered me the opportunity to come and hear what they had to offer. Of course, I knew already, I had prejudged them and this whole situation. I knew that I didn't want what they had to offer. But it did make me think, what is my stance toward others with whom I have a fundamental disagreement? Is there room in my faith or in my life for that? And why is it that sometimes I am so closed-minded and so quick to judge and so sure of my own position? I remember hearing a really great preacher, uh, James Forbes was his name, at a conference once, and he talked about the two basic stances that we have in the world towards the world, towards others, and towards social problems, like racism, for example, The one stance is a kind of closed-in stance. We might, in these COVID times, call it the, the sheltered stance, turning away so as not to see or know or hear. Forbes called this the closed fist stance. The second stance is more open and engaging, the how may I help you kind of stance, which comes from a place of deep grounding and assurance. And Forbes called this the open-fisted stance. It seems to me that one of the gifts of the Pentecost spirit is this ability and possibility of this open-handed stance toward others, toward the world, and toward social problems, and the power to have this stance in the world, this open stance comes from the Holy Spirit. What would Jesus do then, following that t-shirt message of those two young women? I think he would encourage the open-handed stance. The Gospels are full of examples, but in your life and in mine, I find that the will is often not there to maintain it, or the patience, or the angst we feel when we feel like we might be losing control of a situation. I find this true, especially in family matters. For many of us, I think our default stance is closed. Our default stance is closed. We only engage in the open-handed stance when we're reminded of it, like this, perhaps at church, or when we witness someone else performing a great deed of self-sacrifice. But on the whole, and in general, in our everyday lives, is this even something we would want? Because an open-handed stance requires a renegotiation of all the terms of our relationships, and that is really hard work. And again, I find that as things open up in this COVID world of ours, the practice of being closed will require a whole new set of rules and protocols for becoming open again. And sorting these all out, even just on a personal level, I have found already very exhausting. And we are just at the beginning of that journey. A few years back, there was a story on the news about a guy named Julio Diaz. Julio worked in New York and traveled back and forth on the subway to the Bronx, where he was from. On the way home, at least one night a week, he always stopped in the same diner and had dinner there. It was something that he looked forward to every week. 
One night, as he was exiting the subway station, a young man came at him with a knife and demanded his wallet. So Julio just gave it to him. And then he said to the young guy, he said, it's cold out and I can see that you don't have a coat. So would you like to have mine? And the young man was startled and he asked why Julio was doing this. Julio said he must really need the money in his wallet if he couldn't afford to buy a coat. So this kind of disarmed the assailant, so to speak, and he didn't know what to do. So as he stood there, then Julio said, you know, right across the road here is my favorite restaurant. I'm just going in to have dinner. Would you like to join me? And so the young man did. And in the restaurant, of course, because Julio was a regular customer, they all knew him. Even the dishwasher came out to say hi to him. And the young man was kind of impressed that everybody knew this uh, Julio. When it was time to go, Julio looked over at the young man and said, Now, you have to pay for dinner because you have my wallet. And the young man said, I'll give it back. So Julio said, if you're going to give me back my wallet, why don't you also give me your knife? And he did. We'll never know, of course, what happened to that young man, whether he changed his life entirely, but I'm thinking about Julio and thinking about the courage and bravado that it must have taken to ask for that knife. There's a power in this stance. It affects change. It's kind of like a superpower. Maybe it's one of Superman's 17 powers, because I never can remember all of them. But if you knew that you had that same kind of power coursing through your veins, wouldn't you do the same? In that situation? Ah, probably not, because there's so much risk our love might not be returned. Our attempts at reconciliation might be spurned. Our offer of forgiveness may not hit the mark. But in Julio's case, let's assume that that young man's life was changed forever. Leo Tolstoy was a world-famous writer back in the 19th century in his writings and in his life, he endlessly struggled with the deepest questions of human existence, like, who am I? Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? His many, many works, voluminous as they are, explore all of these themes endlessly. But in the end, he wrote a whole treatise on how there's really only one thing that means anything at all to him in life, and that is the power of love to affect change. He talks of love not as a human kind of love, the kind of love that makes us fall in and out of love with another person, or the kind of thing that a thousand other people uh, value. Love not as a feeling, but as an active presence in one's spirit. The active presence of love that has a power to affect change. Hmm. Imagine, we all have it. Martin Luther King was certainly affected by this teaching. He claimed that the Spirit's energy inside us, and let's remember, we're just one week out of Pentecost, so surely you haven't forgotten already, that uh, he, he claimed that the Spirit's energy inside us was so active and so demanding and so persistent that it required the human heart and soul to engage with this deeper kind of love in circumstances which commanded it. So, You've heard him speak. You've heard those speeches. You can hear the force of Martin Luther King's words, even in your ears right now, I'm sure. And at the time, if you were black and engaged in the struggle for human rights, 
or gay and exchange and um, engaged in the struggle for pride or a refugee in the struggle for acceptance in a country that despises you you must actively call on the deepest vein of love in your spirit each and every day in other words he was saying all of the oppressed must have this open-handed stance toward the world that hates them it's a heavy burden to place on people. King was adamant, though. He claimed that when a white person hates you, you must not return the hate. When you're abused, denied your human rights, when you were separated by the color of your skin, when you're judged as less than human, when others trample on your soul as well as your body, you must not return the hate. How does one do that? At once, I hear how hard it must be for the people of Minnesota. Oh, Martin Luther King, where are you now? So I think of those young women wearing those WWJD shirts wouldn't it be more correct to say, what would love do? What would love do in this world of ours, in Minnesota or Washington, or again in our own family situation, or in the mood midst of a prolonged COVID uh, crisis where our nerves and everything else about us are, let's face it, starting to fray? What would love do? do. In today's reading, something really incredible is going on in that little story of the uh, rich man who encounters Jesus, because we're in a very long section. This takes place in the midst of a very long section of testing by the authorities. And so Jesus is, from one story to the next, he's put up against the authorities of the day who are challenging him and trying to trip him up or lay a trap for him. And most of the time, they really hate Jesus' answers. And Mark tries to make the point again and again that the reason Jesus got himself crucified was because he stood up against the authorities of the day. But in this encounter we get a real glimpse into the personhood of Jesus. Because the scribe is very polite. And he asks Jesus a question. It's probably a trick question. He's probably laying a trap. And Jesus responds with a question, and then the scribe answers really well. And then... He turns to the scribe, and I don't think I've ever noticed this verse until this week. He turns to the scribe, and he loved him. There's that active presence of the Holy Spirit in the world. That small little story or detail in that story, it makes all the difference to me. For Jesus, love was an action against systemic oppression and violence. And then Jesus says something really nice. He says to the man, probably the greatest compliment he could give him, he says, you, my friend, are not far from the kingdom In other places, we read how Jesus teaches us to love our enemies. And here in Mark, he shows us how to do it. Love is the core activity of the Spirit that we got reminded about last week at Pentecost, but which is already in us. It wasn't something new that came along to us on the day of Pentecost. We already have it in us. But we need to be reminded because we know deep down that we are all born inside the energy of love eternal, don't we? And that burning fire of the animating spirit of life, well, it just can't be doused like we douse a campfire at the end of a night. 
We can cover it over. We can turn away. We can claim it's not our battle, like the current eruption of anti-racism, for example. We can adapt or adopt that turning inward stance, that default stance. But then we would be denying our spiritual inheritance. And in a post-truth world, I don't know about you, I want to hang on to the deepest, truest thing I know. There's a lot of anger in our world right now. Can love's power actually conquer it? There's a lot of distrust in our world. Can love's power diminish it? There's a lot of blame and shame going on in our world right now. Can love's power change the conversation? Pentecost, the spirit of it, is in us saying, yes. Yes. We don't have to search for the power. We don't have to manufacture it. We just have to stay open to it. We always have within us the ability to speak love, to hate, and hope to fear and to bring resolutions to problems. Always. But look, none of us is going to be the next Gandhi or Martin Luther King or even uh, Julio Diaz. I'm certainly not that brave. There's some truth to the notion, perhaps, that at least on the large scale, we're not going to be able to move that needle very much. But on the other hand, we each carry within us a piece of the light. And without our light shining in the world, things are a lot dimmer these days. So let's head into Pentecost season with courage, with love, with a light to shine to the world around us, right here in our community. And let's open our stance again so that the Spirit can do its work. May it be so. Amen. Ah, our last hymn, Here I Am, Lord. Here I Am, Lord.
very much for uh, sharing this morning with us and for tuning in once again. For our benediction, um, each phrase ends with, may I walk? It's a Navajo, um, it's called the Navajo Way Blessing Ceremony. With beauty before me, may I walk. With beauty behind me, may I walk. With beauty above me, may I walk. With beauty around me, may I walk. Through the returning seasons, may I walk. On the trail marked with pollen, may I walk. With dew about my feet, may I walk. With beauty before me, may I walk. With beauty behind me, may I walk. With beauty below me, may I walk. With beauty above me, may I walk. With beauty all around me, may I walk. In old age, wandering a trail of beauty, lively, may I walk. In old age, wandering on a trail of beauty, living again, may I walk. Everything is finished in beauty. May it be so. Amen.